for example, we're using some music apps that integrate with Canvas and can even show up inside of Canvas to students like within a window and link straight to assignments. And the fact that even can happen is a miracle to me, given the, the kind so of... There's a standard API for hooking into learning management systems. So... Interesting. Okay, so is that... So that must be not as it must not be a different process than for like Google Classroom, Canvas, Blackboard. Google Classroom, I get the impression is built a little differently, but for like Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle, Schoolology, or whatever it is, those all use a like standard intercommunication language called LTI. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And so it's just like XML files that they keep sending back and forth. But it's they're structured in a standard way so that most products don't have to like reinvent the wheel. I have integrations with the publisher of the textbook that I use, which has some cool stuff. And we tried to integrate Aurelia from Rising uh -huh. Software, but our campus IT people biffed that one. And so we it, that was a nightmare at the beginning of the semester. But let's see. Is this the show? I don't have any <laughs> idea. I was just gonna ask if I should read. <laughs> We're 35 minutes in, and we've been just kvetching. Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. Thanks to my sponsor this week, Music First. With me today is David McDonald. David McDonald, how's it going? That's a, a bigger question than it was just a few months ago. <laughs> I'm I'm still figuring it out, but I, I, at the moment, it seems to be okay. Yourself? Yeah, it's good for all the reasons that we've just been talking about before we started. Um, and then on top of all that, I've just been, this is a, a thing that I call chain smoking Zoom meetings. You know, you watch, I'm not a smoker, but you watch chain smokers and they, they light the new cigarette off of the old cigarette. It's just as soon as one Zoom meeting ends, you start the next one. I've been doing that since 8.30 this morning, so how we're many, in great shape. How many of those consecutively does it take before you start to really feel it? Less than one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's not good. You're, that's the, here's the thing. is like I So far, I've had just one day of school, and I had two classes. So I have been... And not including like the prep time, logging into the Google Meet early and staying late to field questions. I've been in, officially speaking, one and a half hours of Google Meet classes since the start of the school year. I, I was, you know, joking and, and, and being goofy, but it, it's the thing that's bad is how relentless it is because you're so on the whole time. I have, I have some days where I, I, I'm in class and then immediately in another class and in, in a normal situation I would have time to walk back to my office and have some time walking to the next building or the next classroom or whatever. And here I close the one zoom and then I open the next zoom and it's just me the next time. And then I go close that zoom and I open the next zoom and it's a lesson and lessons are, are a time when you have to be like more on than usual anyway, because you're the only other person in the room. But it's just, I, I don't know, I find it really draining. And I felt at the end of uh, a few days in the semester when I would normally feel like super energized and very excited for the music my students are going to write and the things they're going to explore this semester. And I just didn't feel that this semester. It was, it was, it was very sad. Yeah, that makes so. total sense. Are you, so one of the things being a performing ensemble director that I anticipate will really drain me is much more luxury and like we really play in the band classes like i try to keep them playing as high a percentage of the class time as possible with very quick fast musical feedback in between reps to keep things engaged and i already am just feeling oh i'm gonna just be talking at them so much this year are you finding that student interaction versus lecture time has been different the past couple of weeks yeah and the lectures are tough when you don't have the direct feedback from students because you can't really see them a few of them have their cameras on a few of them have their mics open but they're, they're always the minority and it so it it feels even more like a one-way thing than a lecture normally would feel like in a classroom yeah it's been tough i try to use zoom breakout rooms as much as makes sense there are some times when that's hard to figure out the best way to do when you're teaching kind of fundamental concepts and 
theory one like there's only so much discussion you can have about how to draw an alto clef so we i've been trying to get those and the other thing i found is that if i do one of those toward the beginning of the session they are more likely to turn their cameras and microphones on for that and then leave them on when they come back from the breakout rooms interesting so that has helped a little bit but yeah it's tough Interesting, because one of the ongoing uh, discussions amongst the band teachers is in my district is that we're going to run some amount of live rehearsal just with the kids on mute, and that introduces a lot of issues with you know, the, the musical feedback loop, like me hearing kids and then giving quick feedback. I can't hear them all at once. I also can't address them all at once in the same way, but, but I am hoping that this added benefit of having them playing right from the start of class and also visible on screen will have more or less that same effect where they'll just decide to leave it on yeah and i think there's some updates coming to zoom i don't think they're here yet that will give you a little bit more control over muting and unmuting kind of manually each person so right right now if they're muted you have to request that they unmute but i think you'll pretty soon be able to like just go in and unmute them yourself yeah because the idea that sounds awesome because the idea is scale two three four play it and then trumpets, two, three, four, and now they're unmuted and then I'm hearing them. So some kind of control of that would be cool. Yeah, it's a kind of like matrix system that uh, in a lot of like piano classrooms where the teacher has headphones on and they can just like bounce from person to person and it just instantly clicks over to them. Right. And that's all hardware based. That's the beauty of a hardware system is that it's super reliable. It only works in that room, but it's super reliable and instant. So... Yeah, yeah, but I need that, and I, that's exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, Google Meet will have it in a year or, or eight. We're just getting some of the real. I'm talking about like the real popular Zoom features of the past couple of months. Things like the back, you can make your background a beach, or you can. I don't until recently, you can't even have a keep a kid from entering the meet before you. You can just come into your classroom and there are like eight kids hanging out (laughs) doing whatever i'm sure they're up to everything good i'm actually i'm surprised at how little of that happens before the change occurred wow Um, i feel like if i was one of them i would be there super early all the time because i would never get to see anybody it would be like the only time i'm also there super early so Uh and i i make it hard for them to i have like loud music intro music and a static slide on the screen and it's not if you're in a physical space you can go over in the corner and have a conversation that the teacher is unaware of exactly right yeah the management is certainly a little easier yeah. you mentioned some zoom features i one of the things that i definitely wanted to talk about today is you have been writing about and you know have just been super vocal on social media about a lot of these new zoom features for musicians i because i'm using google meet and depending on it more i haven't explored any of these new settings but i would love first of all to refer people to i know that you did a whole episode of let me back up for a second and actually just acknowledge you you have been podcasting since we last spoke on this show yeah it's a new old thing for me i used to do a podcast many years ago that was a about new music called sound notion no longer exists you can't find the archives anymore i'm very sorry the the hosting bill was too much but that was a podcast i did with some other composer friends of mine and this new project is from scoring notes which is a website blog publication now podcast about music notation and related technologies as the publisher likes to say and it used to be sibelius blog if you've been around sibelius long enough and then when the people that made sibelius moved to Steinberg, that didn't make sense for them to write a blog called sibelius blog anymore and so so like i took it over and turned it into scoring notes anyway we've been making podcasts since probably the middle of the summer about all kinds of things related to music notation, even if only tangentially. And part of that was this new Zoom stuff that you were talking about. Yeah, and so that was, I was going to say, anyone who's interested in learning more about these Zoom features, later this week I'm going to just post a blog post with a bunch of links to resources of other people who have written about this on the internet, one of which is Scoring Notes itself. You did a podcast episode and a blog post detailing these new features. Yeah. The, the director's commentary model of, of podcasting did the the blog post and Philip said, hey, how about this afternoon we come on and talk about it even more? And so that's what we did. And uh, it's pretty exciting. If, any, if your listener has used Zoom or Google Hangouts or any of these platforms before, you know that it's 
audio is really tuned to having conversations with another person and it doesn't always work very well for the way we want to do music over them. So I don't know what your experience has been with Google Meet, but uh, does it do the same thing that Zoom has always done where it's doing this weird kind of sidechain compression where it picks the loudest one or maybe two or three people and then just destroys everybody else's levels so you only hear one or two or three people at a time? Zoom is like uniquely bad at making decisions, even yes. though in the settings you can have more control. So it's especially bad. I, I use Zoom most often in my private lessons and those are percussion lessons. So we're having like xylophone and snare drum performances that are happening where the phone is just a couple feet away from the kid. So yeah, you have someone play fortissimo on a snare drum and all of a sudden, I mean, the, the, whatever algorithm Zoom is using to compress the audio is so wild that I can see someone's sticks coming up 12 inches in the air and it sounds like they're on mute. Yeah, my percussion friends tell me that it is particularly bad at snare drum. That's what I've heard from people that have used it to teach lessons is that it is, Zoom is uniquely bad for snare drum sounds. And I have no idea what they're doing. Like you said, who knows what they use to tune these algorithms, but it is certainly not related to anything that we do. But it, they've had this feature to turn on original sound for a very long time. It's only recently been available on the mobile apps since probably April or so. And it's awkwardly, misleadingly named. It says turn on original sound, but it was still doing an awful lot of stuff to the audio. And so they worked with a bunch of musicians on this. I know I've heard some social media stuff and some various online panel discussions from musicians who were involved in consulting with the company on this. And Basically, there is a new high fidelity music mode is what it's called. If you have turned on original sound in Zoom, the same place you go to there, which is settings, audio, advanced, and then you can turn on original sound. And then only when you have turned on original sound, you will see that there is yet another tick box for uh, high fidelity music mode or something like that. It's, it's called different things in different parts of the user interface, which is always a bad sign. But once you turn that on, You'll still get the same turn on original sound button in the call, but ideally it's doing a lot less processing and compression and increasing the bit rate of the data compression. And in their initial blog post, Zoom said that you would need to have a bunch of fancy audio gear to take advantage of it. And it's probably true that you do need to have something more than your laptop's built-in microphone to get the most out of it. You can still turn off the really worst of the processing, even if you are just using your built-in uh, computer microphone and speakers now it still doesn't work for mobile so this is not an option that exists on zoom for ios or android so you still have to be using a mac or a windows computer to to get this setting it might come to the mobile platform later i'm never quite sure how either how invested they are in bringing this stuff to mobile or even what would be possible on mobile i know sometimes they're working with kind of higher level technologies that don't let them get into the weeds of exactly the feed that's coming directly in from the microphone. But yeah, it's it's not great on mobile right now. It's a lot better on desktop though. If you would plug in your own audio interface and a fancy pants microphone into Zoom, would it still be doing some of that audio processing or would you still need to click the use original sound? You would still need to click use original. So this is like an a, additional layer of use original sound okay this so is like, it it's like a special mode of original sound that could be called i don't know original sound if if we were renaming it today sure. but it's doing a lot less processing at that point yeah i have to this is maybe a good transition to something else i wanted to talk about everyone should of course go read everything that you wrote in your recent podcast they should listen if they want to learn more about all these zoom features i have two philosophies about tech setup and software tech that I use to teach online. I have a very bare bones approach and then a really fussy approach. And I live in these two extremes because oftentimes the second you start getting into the weeds, you have to go really far before you get any payoff. So like for me, the two modes of teaching online are I'm in my sunroom and I'm doing a FaceTime call with my private student from phone to phone. And fortunately, FaceTime makes honestly like pretty smart audio decisions for as bare bones as it is. It's they're making all of the decisions for you, but they're making, I think, decent decisions. 
And that is a totally like back when teachers were first moving to online back in March, this was everyone was freaking out. Which chat app do I use? Which device do I do I need to get a fancy microphone? And like, honestly, for engaging kids, especially younger kids musically, like a FaceTime to FaceTime call is totally tenable. But then there's like now a host of teachers that are emailing me specifically as this year was gearing up who want to just go a little bit further and they're willing to buy an interface or maybe even just a nice microphone. And this is an area of technology that I struggle with because the second I start thinking about that stuff, I go down the rabbit hole. And and that's what I've been doing over these past few weeks with OBS. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about yeah. that. OBS is something that I have only heard about until maybe about a month ago when you and a couple of other people online were recommending that I try it. It was actually, do you know Will Kuhn? The name sounds familiar. I don't think I know him. Will Kuhn is a music technology educator in Lebanon who is, no, he's just really a widely respected educator, specifically with Ableton Live. And he is one of the people who at least publicly has been known to have replaced his entire tech lab with the Ableton push at every computer. <laughs> and he has uh, a new book coming out this, I think later this fall and uh, has started doing every, he has a, a Twitch channel where he streams every Sunday night at, uh, I'll put a link in the notes to this show. Um, I think 5 PM it's called uh, digital music school. And it is a Twitch stream of him talking about Ableton Live curriculum and how he does it in his high school music classroom. And I just, as a friend of his, not someone who really is going to ever use those tools to teach, I just logged in to his first couple Twitch streams and like his professionalism with the stream was just next level. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, dude, just download OBS. It's free. (laughs) You'll see you'll get the hang of everything because he's just got multiple GoPros plugged in his computer. So like one is looking down at what his fingers are doing on the Ableton push while another is looking at his screen while another is looking at his head and he's got a nice colorful background and his digital music school logo is like at the top of the screen and he's really seamlessly switching between these different views. And I told him, I'm like, I don't know how to do any of that. turns out OBS this whole time was just waiting for me to install it on my computer and do some tinkering. Yeah, OBS is is really rad and it is it's been around for a long time. It's OBS stands for Open Broadcasting Software, Open Broadcasting System maybe, but it is a a, a way of combining video feeds basically and and cooking video feeds into a single video feed that you can then send to a, a stream somewhere. And I've been using it for a, a little while for live streams of concerts. When I first got to Witch the State, I helped them set up their concert live streaming infrastructure. And it was just, it remains a single camera and has graphic overlays for the ensemble and the program. We've been doing that in OBS for a little while. And OBS has these great ways to connect to all the major streaming services. So that was great. So you can send your feed directly to YouTube or Facebook Live, which is what we use for our concerts at Wichita State. Twitch is another big one. It's super geared toward game streaming. So if you go looking for information about it, make sure you include the word Mac in your Google search results because it is a super Windows heavy community because it's super based around gaming. And for a long time, the Mac version of it was way less useful than the Windows version of it. They've gotten a lot closer to parity now, notably in the last few months. And and I think this is a combination of changes in the Mac operating system, changes in Zoom and other video conferencing systems, and a plugin in OBS called uh, Virtual Webcam that has to use a completely different technology than virtual webcam on windows because windows has this cool video uh subsystem called direct show that the mac operating system doesn't have and so they had to completely use a different system for this but you can now combine your different camera angles and graphics and do all kinds of different window capture things so that you're doing desktop window screen sharing kinds of stuff and position them all how you want and do whatever kind of flipping and rotating or shrinking and cropping all kinds of stuff and then send one virtual webcam feed to an app on your computer. So I use this for Zoom 
So I have a camera that has my face and then I've got a couple of different screen captures set up and then I just send those all to the virtual webcam and then that basically creates you know, this fake webcam that in Zoom I then select instead of selecting my camera from the list of camera options, I select this fake camera from OBS and then I don't touch it anymore. So I don't use the screen share thing in Zoom. I just use screen captures from OBS and you can switch it really easily whenever you want in OBS. And that just runs in the background the whole time I'm teaching. Yeah, it's awesome. That's, and that's more or less as far as I've gone with it. I have installed a couple of extra little plugins that help me to gather some video sources. So like for me, I know um, something that's fun to do is to take sheet music on my iPad and then stream it into a video source in OBS. And so that's fun. I'm using Air Server for that which is uh, okay. an app for, uh, I think it's it's on Windows and Mac, but the teacher discount was only 11 bucks for all the useful things it can do. It's great. It's What I'm using it for is I'm streaming the screen of my iPad to my Mac, but then uh, in OBS, you can set that up as a video source and just have that be a little window. Is there a special video source for Air Server or are you just using the regular window capture of the Air Server window? You could do that, but they have instructions on their website. You set it up as a, I forget which video source option you choose off the top of my head. Let me open it up. Yeah, they, they just have, I'll link it in the notes to this episode. You can go to their website and they have a, it was super easy. They have instructions. That's very interesting. That they- I have Air Server on one computer and Reflector from Air Squirrels on my other computer. And I just use them differently. I found in my experience, Air Server works a little bit better in hostile networking environments like a a school than uh, Reflector does. And so that's why I have it on my laptop. But I have, it's a single computer license. And so that one's on my laptop and Reflector is on my iMac, which is where I'm teaching when I'm at home. And if, but if there is an Air Server connection directly into OBS, then I would I would be very interested in in trying to switch over because I I like that very much. And I do the same thing. I use my when I'm teaching theory lectures, I have a whiteboard and any musical examples on my iPad that I mark up with the Apple Pencil, and I share that in OBS. And one cool thing in OBS that I can do is that I can combine that with my my webcam, so I can put myself in the corner. And then still be writing and I can still gesticulate like a crazy person while I'm teaching, which is an important part of my hamming it up for, I I know you teach younger students than I do, but it's still valuable to be a, a, you know, total nonsense goofball sometimes. And then I also have a system for showing a live piano keyboard while I'm teaching as well, both with my, so I've got an OBS scene set up that's my camera with the keyboard at the bottom and also my airplay thing with the keyboard at the bottom And the cool thing there is I've got a a hardware MIDI keyboard to my left the whole time I'm teaching when I'm at home. And there there is a little piano keyboard that shows up on the bottom of the screen. And when I play any keys on the hardware keyboard, those keys light up on the screen for the students watching at home. It's it's great. Yeah, I know. I have two really similar scenes. One, One is great for the private lessons. It is the iPad Air Server setup. By the way, I Air Server is you have to set it up as a siphon client. I That's don't what know. it's called. Yes. I don't okay. know what that means, but it's very easy to do if you follow the instructions. Oh, and I should also mention, and we'll, we'll link, you wrote a blog post about setting up your keyboard scene with the keyboard with the light up keys on the bottom. So I have a, I stole your, the, that app that you recommended in your blog post. I downloaded that because I, I just liked how simple and clean the keyboard was. And yeah. I use that as the basis for a scene, which has my head, my webcam in one of the corners. And then also, of course, puts the sheet music from the iPad up there and then i actually the sound i'm using loopback to loop logic pro through because to be i'm gonna be totally honest with you i'm getting feedback from my students that my electric drums and the marimba patch in logic sound better quality to them streaming them over loopback than me actually taking any of my devices to the parts of my studio that have those instruments (laughs) so so i'm like down here um (laughs) like playing the first cello suite with the marimba patch on my logic keyboard and the keys are lighting up on screen for them to see. And I can zoom right in on the iPad score to like exactly which note they played incorrectly. And it's this multimedia experience that's super engaging for them. Yeah. 
Yeah, and in, and it's actually this is one of those things that I've discovered that I think is more powerful doing on. There's not an easy way. It's not. To be honest, what we're talking about is not super simple. Once you set it up, it stays set up, but it's a little bit non-trivial to set up the first time. But it's definitely something that I would not be able to as easily accomplish in the classroom. And it's it's nice to find those things where they exist because there seem to be so few of them. Maybe I should give more credit and look for more of them in more places. But anyway, the keyboard app that Robbie mentioned is called Virtual MIDI Piano Keyboard, VMPK. Mm-hmm. And it's free and open source. And it's as ugly as all open source software is. But the piano keyboard part of it is is very clear. I, I, I know people who use other software for this. There's actually one that's specifically built for demonstrating things in class. And it's a little bit more fiddly than I want to deal with. It's got, you can even show things on a staff as well as the, the keyboard. That's beyond what I really need to mess with. And the price is right. This thing is free. Um, and it's it works great. You can change the colors. I just realized recently that I can turn off the setting where it changes the hue based on your velocity, how hard you hit the note. Because I'm like fiddling at the end of my fingertips over here while I'm teaching on my hardware keyboard. And I'm a terrible pianist to begin with. So I don't need them to see how, you know, how poorly I pressed that one key compared to the other key. So you can turn it off. You can just make it all the same shade of whatever. But anyway, it's very clear and students can see really easily half steps and whole steps. And we're going to be talking about minor scales and intervals in the next few weeks. It'll be a really useful thing for them to be able to see and count half steps on my piano keyboard live as I press the notes. Yeah, it's superior. It's so good. I'm having like a couple of minor technical issues getting it to work in Google Meet that I'm going to ask you about after we're done recording because they're not very motivating for people to hear who might be excited to try what we're talking about. And then the the thing that that ties it all together for me recently, and I, I'm also using Loopback, uh, by the way, and this is goes into your category of I either want the absolute simplest way to do the thing or I I will go far overboard and the when people ask me like how do you do whatever with the audio i show them how to do it in zoom without loopback because like the people that are asking that question are not going to drop a hundred dollars on loopback and there's not anything in between the free zoom audio capture thing and a hundred dollars in loopback so yeah I, there, there's a surprising number of people who are close to me who have bought <laughs> loopback over the past few really have, and have not regretted it yeah there's it's so few- good it's so good. Yeah, I actually bought all of Rogue Amoeba's fine Mac apps over the summer because I wanted I wanted to try the, to load up all of the warm-ups I have for my band into Farago, which is their soundboard app. And that came with a podcast pack that they give an educator discount on, although I had to email them to find a link to the page or to, the, to get a code for the educator discount, but they will offer an educator discount. Good to um, know. Yeah, and and I didn't know if I needed Fission, which is their audio editor, but I actually think the workflow is a little bit better for um, what I do really often, which is take a quick audio file in QuickTime and then select a section of it and then export that as a new file. It's just got a better... It doesn't have a pretty user interface, but it has a, a more intuitive user interface for doing that kind of quick edit. It's just a, a drag and a keyboard shortcut to take a snippet right. of an audio file and save it as a new file. So I'm really liking it i set all of my mp3 files on my computer and wave files to open in fission by default and so i rogue amoeba is like saving the day for me there i yeah. all i bought all their stuff this summer yeah between loopback and audio hijack and sound source i i feel like i've gotten more than my money's worth out of every single one of those things those are the only three that i have and they're amazing and i've, I've been using a lot of them over the last few weeks for sure Sound source is killer. I th- there's so many things you can do with it. Like just the fact that Zoom sometimes xylophone sounds a little harsh over Zoom calls. I just turn it down to fifty percent, and because oh, yeah. you can individually control the volume output of every one of your apps, that's really easy to do. What's the other thing? And, and just, I do that in Loopback, so I don't necessarily always feel like I need to control it just for for me. But I'll move sliders around in Loopback sometimes. And then depending on the music that I'm listening to in in my class, I might we might listen to. Uh, a funk t- like we the other day we listened to september for a part of class earth wind and fire and then a little bit later in the class 
we listen to a Mozart piano sonata or something. And like, those are not going to be even remotely near the same level of volume appropriate to send out to Zoom. So having some way of controlling that is really nice. There's also, I'm using Spotify, there's audio level for the Spotify app that's very useful as well. And that I can control with my, I got a new piece of kit recently. I got a Stream Deck XL. And there's, if you talked about your Stream Deck before, I was going to get to that. I was going to get okay. to that. I wanted to mention one more. Did I plug jump the gun? For, yeah, go for it's, it. No, it's cool. We're going to get to it. But no, so t- definitely sound. Which one we were just talking about? Sound source. Yeah, sound source is good. I want. I have to tell you one other really nerdy thing that I did with sound source because this was like the thing where I, I know that I'm this is notes. about. Yeah, this was so I knew you could do this just from having seen some different screenshots of the app, and I for fun I was doing this thing where I'll play it. So I'm I'm looping back Adagio through the zoom call to my student and i'm having him play along the snare drum parts of scheherazade to the recording and we're we're playing different recordings because adagio is a streaming classical music app it's got like hundreds probably thousands of recordings of that piece and we're listening to different recordings and listening to the different kinds of styles it's played and i'm having him play along to different uh, versions and this one version we get to is just a really old recording and it's super noisy and I go into sound source and you can actually take the output of an individual app and apply your audio plugins directly to the output of that app. So I opened up an instance of Isotope's RX spectral denoise and I had it learn the noise that was in the background of that recording of Scheherazade from like the 30s and then I like right there live on the spot, it just continued to run and cleared it up so that you could hear it better so, <laughs> right from within sound source. Okay, this is some crazy new technology. I might have to I might have to do this. It's wild. Because I, I do ha- I have RX seven. I I've not I haven't decided if I need RX eight badly enough for another hundred and fifty dollars. I didn't even know there was an eight. Is that really recent? Just like this last week. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You shouldn't have told me that. I don't need. I, I I can't came very close several times, and then I thought, no, I just bought this other thing. I'm I'm good for now. Yeah. A- until I upgrade to Big Sur and it doesn't work. Oh, don't even say that. Yeah, because Isotope was pretty slow to get all their stuff running on Catalina. All these pro apps are always pretty slow, and apparently there were some non-trivial, or there are some non-trivial audio system changes in Big Sur, and like the Rogue Amoeba stuff doesn't work on the Big Sur beta yet. Just yet another reason to not jump into beta land is that your Rogue Amoeba stuff will stop working. But yeah, that's what I'm afraid of, and their sale on the new version ends sometime in October, which means... I don't know if I'm going to be ready to spend $150 between now and October on RX-8, but uh, I'm certainly not ready to do it today as we speak in the early part of September. Yeah, for sure. I, I have this thing where every every couple of years I just I splurge on some software plugins, and, and they're legit, more often than not are software plugins that I have no business owning. They are like string sample libraries that i just want to noodle around on in logic and i need to find like the most i think the perfect role for my software plugins would be if i met someone who could who was into like making video games but they were like as amateur as can be but as but competent enough that they could like actually make a thing i don't know what I don't know if there's a, pl- a person like that or a place like that, but I just want to take all my fun string patches and have someone say, okay, this level is in a cave. And I'm like, okay, here we go. <laughs> here's my <laughs> here's my frozen strings patch with uh, cello making like really cold kind of timbre. And then I've got like a raindroppy percussive sounding drum with like lots of reverb that I'll like have ambiently pittering pattering in the background and this is what i do but no rx is actually a a series of plugins that i did impulse purchase within the past year and i use every single time i I edit this podcast it's really cool it's very impressive stuff the last time i was on the show did we talk about my extraordinarily limited career as a video game composer you talked so i feel like we should also refer to your awesome interview on the mac power users podcast which you definitely talked about it there so the Mac Power Users podcast is a very different audience than this podcast audience. It, it, I, I'll point out to you something that I did not say on there. I used sample libraries there. I used a few different sample libraries. I have a few contact libraries that I've purchased at various Sonic Couture sales, like Black Friday Sonic Couture sales. The The Grand Marimba from Sonic Couture is pretty amazing. But 
the bulk of the sounds from there were from the East West libraries and every, I think it's every month you can pay as the, there's an education discount. They have a subscription composer cloud X and there's composer cloud X edu or composer cloud X student or something like that. And with an annual commitment, it's 15 bucks a month without it's 20 bucks a month, but you get access to basically not quite, but basically every East West library that they've ever published at the gold level, not the like double super duper triple black diamond level, but like the right, like pretty good versions of all of them. And there's a lot and they're really good. I used to be a subscriber. So I used to have actually a church gig where we did like Ableton stuff. And it was like a, the kind of thing where I was like filling in parts of the band that were missing and was using a lot of their stuff to. Yeah. It's, it's definitely good. But then I'm sour because there was like a credit card issue where they like charged me numerous months after I canceled, but we don't have to get into that today. We had a thing last year year two years ago at the university where they were doing i think it was an opera yeah it was an opera where we have a harp our university has one instrument and it was out for service at the manufacturer and so you have to send the entire harp from wichita kansas to chicago illinois to have it worked on and it takes six months or something we're doing this opera that has a harp part and we don't have a harp. And so I hooked up uh, a laptop with my iLock and the East West Harp Library running and a guy at a 88 key MIDI keyboard in the pit. You can't see it. So it does everything's good if you can't see it. And they just did uh, did sample library harp in, I don't remember even what it was. Probably uh, Johnny Skeeky. No, there's no harp in Johnny Skeeky. But it was like a serious, legit opera that we had a fake harp for. So that was fun. Amazing. Yeah, I learned about I, my entry point into a lot of this stuff was do, doing a lot of musical theater performing when uh, I totally. was in grad school. And after that, before I got my first public school teaching gig and actually I was using main stage, which is also on my list for today. So I, everything is connected, it seems. Speaking of which, I, I do want to talk about one more fun OBS plugin, but I'm going to take a break for a sponsor. So I'm like really excited to say that this is the first episode of Music Ed Tech Talk that is sponsored. In fact, the whole month, my blog and the podcast are sponsored by Music First, who is probably not an unfamiliar name to most people who are listening. This is Music First in their own words. Music First offers music educators and their students easy-to-use, affordable cloud-based software that enables music learning, creation, assessment, sharing, and exploration on any device, anywhere, at any time. Music First Classroom is the only learning management system designed specifically for K-12 through music education. It combines the flexibility of an LMS with engaging content and powerful software integrations to help manage your students' progress, make lesson plans, and create assignments. And for younger students, Music First Junior is the perfect online system for teaching elementary general music. It includes a comprehensive K-5 curriculum, hundreds of lessons and songs, and kid-friendly graphics making learning and creating music fun. Whether you're teaching remotely, in person, or in a blended learning environment, Music First will work with you to find a solution that fits your program's unique needs. Try it free for 30 days at musicfirst.com. And I got a link in the show notes to them if you want to learn more about that. I can't imagine anyone listening has not at least heard Music First. You've heard of Music First, right? I have heard of Music First, and I do not teach K-12 music. I I probably have heard it from your show or another similar podcast, but yes. It's interesting we were talking about, and and who knows how much of our... LTI discussion I'll cut from earlier, but they, or maybe I'll put it at the end. Who knows? It's Music the first. bonus content for the paying subscribers. There we go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the B-sides, the B-sides of Music Ed Tech Talk. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Music First is interesting in this field of music education software because they are actually an LMS, but they're also a content library. And then they're also managing these subscription relationships with other online software so it's like this total package integrating together i could go on and on about this but if you've been listening to the show over the summer you've heard the names note flight you've heard soundtrap uh, music first even Uh, people who represent these companies have all been on the show since march and uh, music first integrates a lot of these web-based tools together so you've got things like note flight which is an online score editor soundtrap which is an online daw and sound um, music first not only has pre-made lesson plans that you can 
add right into your classroom, but the lessons link directly out to the tools that they relate to. So if I'm having a student improvise on the blues scale, this is actually a lesson I did. You know, music first really saved my life in my general music class last spring because I had this, uh, I always use this as, as a good example of an assignment. I was teaching the blues scale and uh, there's this whole custom music technology course for middle school that you can just take straight from their course content and then adapt for your own needs. So it's got embedded Spotify playlists of BB King songs and YouTubes that direct them out to extra content about the blues. And then a link directly to a sound trip project where you, you can create a template basically. And I added a shuffle beat to mine and a bass line. And then the kids just improvised the blues on a piano patch right over top. And then they click save and it goes directly into the music first grade book. So it's, it's a really cool tool. It's something that at the least I feel like the music education students who are in your classes probably should be aware of. For sure. It's, it's, it seems really impressive and it definitely, I can imagine it solving a lot of problems that, any K through 12 educator would have, especially now. Yeah. And my understanding is that business has just gone through the roof in recent times and there's a reason for it. And I think that a lot of teachers are going to find that this software that there is, that they're only just now investing in is going to be so good that I think they're going to want to try their hardest to stick with it when school returns to a, an in-person capacity 100% of the time. And the, the thing that I think is easy to, to lose track of when you're looking at music first is the fact that everything is integrated, especially when you're working with younger kids. I imagine just having them sign up for yet another account, yet another thing is such a pain and such a barrier to entry that if they can log into one place and have everything there, that's just a huge win off the bat and having all of that work immediately connected back to all the other work they're doing in other places. I have this problem all the time with getting my students to sign up for new things and they're 20 years old and forget their passwords just as much as an eight year old would. That's and then they one... typed their email address in wrong and they can't get it recovered anyway. <laughs> I wish that's funny. I jumped to, to criticize, but I have been there myself recently. So. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not quite the same problem, but let's just say I've wrestled with my one password database more than once over the past month. <laughs> Let me just real quick, I know you put this on the, the list of possible things to talk about. I guess it does fit in with Music First just because I know that it is a it is one of Music First offerings. So when you purchase Music First for a group of students, what you do is you get a classroom set and then you, they have different offerings for which of the third-party software packages integrate. So I know one of the popular ones for the secondary level is to combine Note Flight and Soundtrap. So you're getting a DAW and you're getting a score editor. But Aurelia is something that a lot of people like to package in with their music first experience. And I know you're using that firsthand. Yeah. Which does the university I teach, uh, mostly year one theory. I used to also teach year two theory. We've shuffled things around. Um, but I'm teaching year one theory and I don't have my own section of oral skills, but I do a lot of kind of many sections of oral skills wrangling is how I think of it. We have a bunch of different instructors. Some of them are theory specialists. Some of them are applied instructors who are all teaching a section of oral skills first year and second year. And when we had to go online last year, I introduced everyone to Aurelia that I had been using in my own sections, even when we were on campus. But Aurelia is an oral skills application and it has some LMS features built in. It connects to a lot of LMSs as well, including something like Music First. But it has a system for doing various kinds of dictations and identification of scales and chords and intervals. And you can use your own materials or you can use their materials. They've got materials that are put in there from... AP theory stuff and from a bunch of different state boards and different national standards bodies that have created their own what Aurelia calls syllabi but that test those same skills that students are expected to meet certain levels for various kinds of certifications and you can pull from all of them and even create your own what I really like about it is it has the options to either you, when you create your own thing you can either use the MIDI playback of a notation thing that you put in for a dictation, or you can actually record an audio file and have students respond to that. And what's cool is some of the built-in materials that are there are also audio files. So instead of like, here's a melody plunked out on MIDI keyboard, 
do a dictation. It's like, Here's this excerpt from the middle of a Tchaikovsky ballet, dictate the oboe solo or something like that, okay. which is really cool. And so there's a bunch of really cool stuff like that in Aurelia. There's, it's, it, the, the management side of it from the instructor's position is not great. And there's a lot of over provisioning. Like it's really easy for one of the instructors who's less technically proficient to like accidentally delete a student's account entirely just as the instructor, not as any kind of administrator. And there's a lot of, and they can accidentally assign an assignment to another instructor. But I will say this, having an integration with another learning management system makes that a lot harder to do, if not impossible to do. So we were trying to get it integrated with Blackboard at my institution this year. It didn't happen for this semester. I'm optimistic that it will happen in the future. But that actually, I think, solves a lot of the problems that I have with Aurelia. Though Aurelia is super cool. It's a little wonky, especially if you are the instructor. It's, I think it's a little easier to, to figure out if you're the student because you have a lot fewer options. But there's a lot of weirdness for figuring out as an instructor. But the upside is you have a ton of options for how to do stuff as well. So I used it for melodic dictation, rhythm dictation, harmonic dictation, where they're doing dictating multiple voices and giving the harmony. You can have them give the harmony as Roman numerals with figures. You can have them give the, har- the harmony as, as jazz chord symbols. There is a very rudimentary like singing component to it. It will try to guess the pitch and tell you if it's right. It's way not nearly as good as the other products out there that do this kind of singing or playing uh, feedback kind of stuff, but there's something rudimentary and they're, they're working on it. And another good thing about it compared to a lot of similar software is that it deals a lot with both jazz chord symbols and jazz harmony stuff, as well as classical harmony. And that's really powerful um, because it means that for a school like ours, where we have people who are teaching both classical music theory concepts and classes for commercial music theory concepts, all the students can use the same thing and we don't have to, and students can bounce back and forth between those and use the same account. And we don't have to wrangle a bunch of different accounts and different softwares and everything like that. And for us as a university where students are buying their own materials, Aurelia can be set up so that students buy their own subscription or it can be set up where the institution buys the subscription. So that's really useful as well. So my students pay 35 bucks and they have Aurelia for a year. And it's it if it had more in the way of like singing materials, we could probably get away with just having them do that. But there's not an anthology to sing from, so they have to get an anthology as well. Now that you're mentioning the integration, I think it, it's putting into perspective something that I have not yet appreciated about all of the different music first software integrations until now because my district has purchased note flight and soundtrap individually which are two things i have and will continue this year to use in my general music class in combination with the music first subscription just because of the, the lesson planning content and how organized and well curated that is because we are doing like the manual management of the LTI integration. Like we're troubleshooting all the weird quirks and bugs. Like you log into, the student has to have logged into NoteFlight specifically through the Canvas integration before you can actually share an assignment with them. And sharing the assignment with them is a distinct action from attaching it to the Canvas assignment that links out to it. Like we're figuring all this stuff out and I'm just thinking, wow, when I use Music First, they just click a button and it takes them straight to the <laughs> to the note flight excerpt that I want them to do. Yeah, we have an LTI integration for materials from the publisher of our music theory textbook, W.W. W. Norton. I, I teach from the Musician's Guide to Theory and Analysis by Clendening and Marvin, which is a really good book for a lot of reasons. That it, and one of the cool features is that they have some online materials that you can integrate through an LTI and there's always a bunch of confusion around that. And then some of the workbook exercises that go with this are available as part of note flight. And so inside the integration for blackboard, there's this other next level of integration into note flight. And that has just always been a complete disaster every time I've tried to do it. So we just haven't done it because the integration is so messy. And so if music first can handle all of that stuff for you, I think that's like, that's worth its weight in gold. Yeah, none of these integrations are perfect. They're all in process and are in progress, I guess I should say. But the the fact that it is as good as it is, like really quite impressive. Too. But, 
we were talking about earlier just to how software is hard and these integrations are tough to do, but it's so great that people are leading the charge with doing this in the music classroom. And, and Aurelia is totally, now that I know that it is possible to bundle it, I'm not sure if we even had it bundled with, and I think our subscription that we were using last spring had the O generator, which is another DAW. And then, oh, and then flat IO is another web-based oh, yeah. score editor that music first just recently started integrating with, but I want to just look at the software because I'm trying to think there's another one that's sounds really complimentary to Aurelia, but it's more of an encyclopedia and it's got pre-made lesson plans about music history and music theory. Oh, interesting. The same company that makes Aurelia also makes a music theory product called Musician, which they spell M-U-S-I-T-I-O-N, but we don't use that. You can get those as, as a bundle from the company's rising software. Okay, um, you can also integrate Musician with a Music First subscription. Also focus on sound, which is the one that I was just thinking of. Interesting. The interactive multimedia music encyclopedia. And while I'm at it, also Sight Reading Factory, Practice First, Soundation, and Groovy Music. All names that might be familiar to listeners. Cool. Yeah, my thanks to Music First for sponsoring the first month of Music Ed Tech Talk. All right, can I tell you about, I'm not a, I want to talk about the Stream Deck, but I, there's one more plugin that you, you've probably heard of. This. I want to hear um, more about OBS. I'm all about OBS. Okay, sweet. I am, this is one of the only other plugins I use. It's called the OBS Camera. It's a $15 iOS app. I'm sure there are free or cheaper ways to do it, but this one is rock solid reliable for me. You plug your iPhone into your computer, you boot up the OBS camera, you create a new video source from the iOS camera, and then you've got a second camera angle. And there are so many things you can do with it. You can have it face right over top of yourself using the Ableton Push, like Will Kuhn, or in my case, I can have my hands on a piano keyboard. What I have it doing right now is it's sitting on um, a tripod stand, which is right above my snare drum, so I can show the mechanics of snare drum technique to my private Like a camera tripod? Accuracy. Yeah, I have a little iPhone attachment I bought on Amazon. I am very interested in this. I have a setup right now. I have had a couple of times to conduct things, like conduct ensemble rehearsals over Zoom, and having my camera just sitting on top of my iMac, I don't, like, I can very quickly get out of frame. My hands are outside and you can't see them. And so I have a tripod thing behind my desk right now so that I can pick my, I, I, I have a camera built into my iMac, but I, I prefer to use my Logitech C920, which I pick up and move behind it so that I've got more room to move my hands around. Yeah. And I, I'm sure that was terrible audio because I just backed away from my microphone, but I've got more room to my, move my hands uh. around. <laughs> and so I have it on a microphone stand and I have this really cool adapter on top of a microphone stand that adapts from the microphone stand screw at the top for a mic clip into a, a camera tripod screw or a quarter 20 tripod screw. And in between is like a ball joint that I can tighten. And so getting my camera into places that are a little smaller or a little tighter is super easy with this little, it's less than 10 bucks on Amazon, this little adapter. And I also have, it's not here at home, but I have a gooseneck microphone stand thing that I can clamp to a table. And so I use that all the time to be able to put a camera on things. And I've got a, a, a holder for my phone that will attach to a tripod. And so I've got this boom arm thing for my, because I've got microphone stands falling out of the everywhere. And so this thing is super useful. That's cool. I'm going to have to get a link for that hardware. I will um, totally send you a link. So you're, I just recently over the summer bought the same Logitech camera that you're referring to. And I have it just sitting on right underneath my monitor. I'm sure that uh -huh. if I put it above my computer, it would look more like I'm looking directly at you right now. So you have it further back, so that's good. That probably gets a, a so right good now angle. my it's just sitting on top of my computer because that's where I where I normally want it. But when I'm conducting rehearsal, it's farther back, and I can switch between the two because I have I still have because sometimes in rehearsal I'll still want to sit here and talk to somebody, and so I can talk on my camera that's built into my iMac, the FaceTime camera, and then when it's time to stand back and conduct something, I can switch to the other camera and take a step back. 
Now, what people so. who are listening don't see is you're rapidly changing between these camera angles as yes. you're showing this to me in our Zoom call. Do you, before that was we just, talk about... just for your benefit, Robbie. <laughs> before we talk about how you're doing that, I know how you're doing that. We're going to get to it. But you look better lit in the Logitech camera. Yes. Are you applying? Because I know OBS can take a camera feed and apply some exposure and some other color settings to it. Are you doing any of that? Or is it just the quality of the camera? It's just the quality of the camera. I've got some lights here. I have some IKEA uh, desk lamp things that tamp, clamp to either side of my desk, and I have gone to the hardware store and gotten big, giant, like floodlight style bulbs, LED bulbs that are a little bit different color temperature, and then I have taken some parchment paper and put it in front of those bulbs to diffuse them a little bit. And so I've got these two giant bulbs on it. I'll have to send you a photo of my setup. But uh, I've got two giant light bulbs on either side that I am uh, using to diffuse. So I've got like really good light and the Logitech camera is better at handling that. Sometimes it's actually a little overblown, and I, but I don't go into the settings. And the Logitech camera has its own settings application that you can download from Logitech that lets you get in and control like the exposure and the white balance and the focus and stuff manually. But I don't mess with that stuff because I have found that those settings don't stick very well between sessions, but it is possible if you, if you wanted to get in and, and tweak stuff, but there's no way to really save those settings. Unfortunately, I found an app on the Mac app store called webcam settings, which mm -hmm. can, I have that app. Okay. Um, and it that, used to be the only way to do it because Logitech used to only make their own app for the the Windows platform. But now you can get it they, for... Does the Logitech app do all of the same stuff? Uh-huh. Okay. It so, looks a little nicer, too. Okay. That's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah. So you're rapidly switching between two different camera videos. You have your IMAX camera and then you have your logitech and you're just rapidly in our zoom call you're switching between them and you were doing that with a device that we have both recently purchased the stream deck the so i decided that after a stressful couple of weeks of the semester i needed to treat myself to a fun little toy and i did that mostly for the benefit of zoom but there are other things that you can do with it as well it's called the stream deck i got the stream deck xl because it's the one that was in stock at my local Best Buy, and I simply could not wait for the Amazon delivery person. And also, I think they were out of stock on Amazon, too, for that matter. But this is a, a little piece of hardware. Mine's about four inches tall, six inches across, that sits on my desk, and it has four rows of eight buttons each. So it's got a, a whole bunch of buttons on the face of it and the buttons have a screen behind them and you can go into the stream deck application on your desktop computer and do whatever you want with it this is one of these tools that's super powerful but does almost literally nothing at all out of the box it requires a fair amount of tweaking and customizing to for it to be able to do anything useful at all but that is a fun thing to do for people like me and possibly people like you and it is incredibly useful once it gets going i am using it largely with zoom right now and it has a bunch of different integrations and plugins that you can bring directly into the stream deck software and a lot of people use it for obs and so there are a lot of nice integrations for obs that you can just get right out of the box so you can have it switch automatically to any of what OBS calls a scene. So I have one scene that is my Logitech camera and another scene that is my Max built-in camera. And I've got a, a scene for uh, what my iPad is doing. You can't see that right now, but with my camera and the piano keyboard and my uh, Chrome browser and my Spotify window and all different things. And I can switch between those rapidly. I can start and stop my Spotify music, regardless of whether the Spotify app is in the foreground. And I can turn up and down the volume on the Spotify app, regardless of whether it's in the foreground. I've got a thing set up to mute my audio in Zoom. So there's a bunch of useful things. And that's just all available to me without having to switch applications or know any keyboard shortcuts or even have my computer's keyboard out in front of me. I've got a keyboard tray. Most of the time when I'm teaching, 
the keyboard tray is pushed in. I'm not using it at all. So it's one less thing to have in front of me. And I've got this little stream deck right at the bottom of my monitor. And it's pretty cool. I've had it for just a couple of days. And I feel pretty happy with that purchase so far. I don't know how you're feeling about your stream deck these days. I'm feeling good. So I am. I haven't gone off the deep end with it yet because I am still figuring out. I'm trying to have it reveal its need to me rather than just going overboard but i've got only um one so i I bought the medium sized one and i actually bought it straight from their website and it shipped within days that's so odd that there were backups elsewhere so yeah i've got one you can customize different layouts like you can have when a certain application on your computer is in the foreground the stream deck can show you controls for just that app right now i just have one grid of buttons and the top row is all OBS scene switching. So I've got one that turns to my webcam, one shows my desktop, one shows the iPhone secondary camera angle, another reveals the screen of my iPad through the air server thing we talked about. And then I've got one that's iPad screen, my webcam and the keyboard app you discussed earlier. Uh, And then I have a couple of variations of that. But then I also have a bunch of soundboard triggers so i've got warm-up skills that are all triggerable from this thing so if i've got like frequent play along tracks that i run in my google meets for my band i can just one tap button those i don't have to go searching through my computer's library i've already booted them all up in a soundboard what i'd love to eventually be able to do is get super creative and uh, have these almost just be like a counterpoint to what's going on in the lesson because you can get pretty fun i can imagine that a student would be pretty engaged if i could turn my especially a middle school student would be pretty excited if their class stream felt like watching their favorite Twitch streamer. I'm starting to work on that with soundboard stuff. One of the things in the band room that we have is I have one of those staples that was easy buttons that I always hit whenever they (laughs) do something that was apparently hard, but they make it look easy. That was easy. That's a one touch button. I've got some things that, so I guess, yeah, we we were also talking earlier about keyboard maestro which is a mac automation tool where you can create a sequence of things that you commonly do and just by uh, looking at a library of actions you can drag and drop a bunch of actions into a sequence and then make an automation that does them all so like i've an example of an automation a really simple automation might be like an action step would be like take the file i have selected in the finder and then the next action would be like press select you know rename from the menu bar and then the next action would say take rename it this this string of characters and then the next one would say press enter and then the next one could duplicate it so you're just you're creating a sequence but using a really friendly user interface to drag and drop the different components of that sequence in order and it's one of these apps that you can get into fairly easily because the interface is is so friendly and and graphical in nature i'll tell you what one thing that i'm using that i think is pretty relevant to what we're talking about is Oftentimes we find that we want to mute our audio in Zoom because we're going to cough or we're going to yell at the cat or whatever. And you can't mute your audio in Zoom if Zoom is not the main frontmost window. So if Zoom is in the background, then so if you've switched over to show them something in, I don't know, note flight or something like that, you can't use that keyboard shortcut which is command shift a on a Mac to mute your microphone. So I have a a button on my stream deck that runs a keyboard maestro script that just has two things. It brings zoom to the foreground and then sends the keyboard shortcut to mute. So no matter what application I'm in, if I press this button, it will mute my audio in zoom. Um, And that's really powerful to me because oftentimes I don't know what is the foreground application because I've got a bunch of things that are all more or less small windows all over my desktop across a couple of monitors. And if I just press this one button, I know it's muted somewhere. That's a perfect example of something that a a teacher would actually use it for. That's what is that? Two steps. (laughs) It's just two actions. And that's the beauty of it, right? It's two really simple things, but that would be really tedious to remember to do every single time you needed to do that on a zoom call. My favorite one that eliminates logistical friction in the band environment is this, uh, and this is definitely a complicated one, but it takes, we've got to fill out these loan agreement forms when a student rents an instrument. Mm -hmm. And it's just a lot of clicking around and tabbing around in a PDF that's form fillable. I have one that prompts me for the name of the student, the serial number, and the brand of the instrument up front, and then saves them all as variables. 
And then when I press enter, it takes whatever PDF of that file I have selected in the finder, duplicates it, opens it, fills in all the form fillable things by the variables that I've specified, and then it saves it and closes it and then deletes the, the old copy that it copied it from. So it's really powerful. And it's one of these things where my brain just works better that way rather than like constantly referencing back and forth between some data that a, that a parent or a student sent me an email or something that's in an inventory spreadsheet and then a form that's sitting on my desk. So this just like makes makes it more frictionless for my brain. It, it can do sincere, like seriously everything. The thing that has, I've been experimenting with lately is it can find, you can screenshot a part of your screen like a button of an app or something and then you can have it look for that button on screen and then click in that spot so despite the apple home automation stuff being really customizable and scriptable in terms of automations on ios there's not a ton you can really do with it on the mac so i have created a keyboard maestro that brings a macro is the word for a for an action in Keyboard Maestro. So a, a macro that brings the Apple Home app to the foreground, switches to, hits Command 3, which is, I think, the what views my basement. Uh, and then it looks for the exact button that is to turn on or off the lights in the basement. And I just screenshotted that button in the app and then dragged and dropped the screenshot into the Keyboard Maestro. And so now I have light control down here. It's It's great. <laughs> so... What's cool, though, is that key, I think what we're getting at is that Keyboard Maestro can integrate into the Stream Deck. So all these fancy pants automations can become one-touch buttons basically on what is a little command station in front of you. I love it. I don't have anything else to say about it. <laughs> I'm excited I, you got it, It's super it, powerful. I, I, I really like it. I've gotten – so we mentioned Philip Rothman in Scoring Notes earlier. He has a store that tells a bunch of various – music engraving fonts and and things like that. But some of the things that he sells are actually really thorough Stream Deck profiles. And so you can buy a Stream Deck profile for Sibelius or for Dorico or for MuseScore that has a bunch of functions built in if you don't have the normal keyboard shortcuts under your fingertips or if you just like navigating them in a more visual way that doesn't take up any space on the screen you can buy the stream deck uh profile for like all of dorico and so i've got that set up here so i can dig into the the like some of the things that are really tedious to select in dorico are filters for filtering like all of the tuplets that are on this staff or whatever you can grab them all or the highest note of every chord in all of these things. So if you're like expanding uh, an arrangement into a bunch of different things, you might want to select the highest note of everything and delete them and move them into a different part or whatever. You can go through and, and grab those filters visually on the stream deck without going through a bunch of levels of menus in uh, Dorico, which is pretty cool. Uh, you got to send me a link to those. That sounds awesome. Yeah, uh, so the store is notationcentral.com and they have Stream Deck profiles for the Stream Deck and the Stream Deck XL for Dorico, Sibelius, and MuseScore. Yeah, Keyboard Maestro. Oh, it can do anything. And I'm just scratching the surface with it, really. Yeah, and, and I think between Keyboard Maestro and Stream Deck, I've got enough to, to keep me busy playing with automations for the next several centuries. Without a doubt. You're... Setup includes also main stage. Is that right? Yeah, main stage is a new addition to my setup. None of the things that we talked about so far actually make noise from my MIDI keyboard, which is important for teaching music. I have experimented with a few different things. VMPK actually can make some noise in the general MIDI range, but it doesn't sound very good. And I did something at some point to make it not make noise anymore. And it's the settings are very fiddly for how it generates audio. So I decided I would rather use something that's going to make better audio anyway. I used GarageBand for a while. You were talking about GarageBand earlier, and that's fine. I've used Logic before as well, and I wanted to find ways to to use nice sounds. And I know the settings and the sounds in Logic and GarageBand are, are awesome, but I thought I would try this new app. It's not new. This new-to-me application that is purpose-built for live sound stuff, and that is MainStage. I had originally intended to use it with some other third-party sample libraries that have some real nice piano sounds that I like, but there's some really good ones that are just built into Logic, and they're the same ones that are available in MainStage. So if you've not used MainStage before, 
it is a lot like Logic, but specifically designed for using live. So for rendering samples from libraries live into whatever processing plugins you want to have. So any audio plugins that you have, any sample libraries that you have, any synthesis systems that you use, they can all work in main stage, just like they work in Logic or Pro Tools or whatever you're using. And it's specifically designed for live, so there's no recording track or anything like that, though you can make a recording within it. It's not really designed for recording and editing, though. It's pretty simple if you've used Logic. It looks a lot like Logic. It's got the same mixer as Logic. It, in fact, I think I haven't tried this, but I think it will actually work with the Logic Remote app for iPad exactly the same way, so you can mix stuff there. I, I remember I saw it for the first time live when I went to see Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones. If you've seen the Synthax drum guitar that Future Man plays, where it's a bunch of buttons on a guitar-shaped object, he's plugged into a MacBook Pro running main stage. That's the ba- There's not a lot to say. It goes out to loopback, and loopback goes into Zoom. That's pretty much it. If I wanted, I could use the fancy east-west samples that we discussed in the past or in the future of whenever I'm saying this, but the the samples that are built into Logic are really good. And I ended my East-West subscription, so I don't have those anymore. So I use Logic for the same purpose you're talking about. And some of the user interface elements are super similar. Main stage blows up a lot of the buttons really big so that they're easier to see yes. and interact with. Very tappable. Tappable, so I've been you say. T- <laughs> clickable. <laughs> Gosh. No one sees. I have a list of topics that I'm, we're slowly picking away at. And every single topic we like hint at five other topics that are on the list (laughs) because everything is interconnected Uh, (laughs) clickable buttons in main stage i so i learned about and that's important because like like i said in the situation that i saw future man using this thing he's obviously when you're performing you're standing much farther away from your screen than you would in a studio and your screen is probably much smaller than it would be in a studio if you have one at all yeah it's definitely more it's bigger and more visual for you to use at a distance for sure. Do you, so if I, can I, so here's the, the main thing that I have set up in logic. I've got a, a logic file called piano and drum. And all this does is it just takes the MIDI. So there's one MIDI track and whatever my keyboard, which is to my right is set to that software instrument will play through logic. And then I've got my digital drum set, which is a Roland Octopad plugged in. It's plugged in through with a MIDI cable and an audio cable, but I usually use the sound library that's built into it. So it's usually coming in as an audio track. And Mm -hmm. the only way that I can easily get both of them to produce audio without clicking anything is to have the Octopad track selected and record enabled while the piano's MIDI track is also record enabled, but not the currently active track. And that means the way that results is I can get sound from either one without switching anything up i can just play drums and piano at the same time i don't know if that would be possible to achieve in main stage just because i'm not too savvy with it but if i could it seems because of the reasons we were just talking about and because it's probably more a little bit more efficient on your computers i I don't know if it necessarily is more efficient but it feels like it is It, it i'll say it's also much faster to switch between instruments than it is in logic and i don't have a hardware setup that is anything like the thing that you're describing so i'm not sure i could say whether it would solve the the problem that you're having with logic clipping in that situation but i think it's worth giving it a shot and and we should also say that the apple pro apps for education bundle is like one of the best deals in education discounts for 200 dollars, you can get all five apple pro apps and main stage is part of that so i think most people when they think of this bundle are thinking of Logic Pro 10 and Final Cut Pro 10, but the, another big one that you got is Main Stage 3, and it's really cool. So for 200 bucks, you get all five of these pro apps, the cheapest of which is normally 200 bucks uh, in the App Store. You should definitely look into that. If you've not done this yet, you have to apply for it, and I think that verification is done manually, so it takes a couple of days, and they just send you a bunch of like coupon codes to use in the Mac App Store, and then you get these five awesome apps you get like i said logic final cut main stage and the other two are compressor and motion compressor with a k i actually have no idea what compressor does motion does motion graphics i have once or twice used compressor to export a big final cut project where exporting it in final cut itself was giving me some trouble and 
so I understand it probably this is not a, an accurate understanding of what it does it is intended to be used for as an export tool amongst other things but i don't think that the proper way to understand its role is as like a reliable <laughs> final cut project exporter it's just like a like maybe a video and there's so the, i i edit in adobe premiere and they have an, a media adobe media encoder is their application that does this so you can same thing as you're describing export a video directly from premiere but if you want to like batch a bunch of exports overnight and have them like automatically get exported and then uploaded as unlisted YouTube videos or whatever, you can do that in Adobe Media Encoder. So it will, if you've got a really long video encode and you're going to go to sleep, then it's probably going to be a big file at the end. And so something like Media Encoder lets you set it up to do the encode and then at like two o'clock in the morning when it's done, it will automatically start then uploading it to your YouTube channel and then it will just live there unlisted until the next morning you get up and it's there. So the, I, I assume you can do something like that with Compressor. It sounds like a tool like that is super useful. And certainly there are other tools that do stuff like this. ScreenFlow has a thing like that, but it's never worked for me. But anyway. Yeah, that, that I, sounds cool. about right. That's what I would suspect. All right, can I move on to this next thing? I Hit me. The last time you came on the show, we talked about your dream computer. And yes. your dream computer was a touch screen iMac that you could use to compose with the precision of a keyboard and mouse or that you could draw right on with an apple pencil yeah there's been a lot of talk in the apple what do you call what's the word for all of the people who professionally cover apple journalism i don't know the apple commentariat the apple yeah. pundit apple punditdom oh that's good <laughs> yeah if you're keeping your ear to the ground about stuff that's happening with apple so there's gonna be this shift that's going to start later this year where the Mac is going to start to use Apple's in-house processor. They're ditching Intel. And they announced this at their developer conference last June. And with this came a lot of other things. I'm seeing a lot of announcements from that conference and trying to put together a bigger picture. Like one of the things they did was the iPad, a lot of the apps got a three-column view, which is taking some design cues from the way that Mac apps have functioned with this new switch to Apple's new processor, which is called Apple Silicon, they're introducing Macs later this year that they've already announced will have native iOS app support, which means that you can just take an app from the iOS app store and run it directly on your Mac, provided that the developer has not checked a button that will prohibit you from doing that. <laughs> We've got just recent... This is pr probably... Like I would have known this earlier if I had been paying attention, but Fourscore has announced that they're making a Mac app. I don't know if you saw that or if we've talked about that. Fourscore, the popular sheet music editor, arguably an industry standard. So I don't know. I'm Am I going all over the place? What I'm trying to get at here is there's been a lot of chatter in the um, Apple universe about that maybe these new Macs are going to have touch screens. Like why would, would iOS apps run natively if you weren't able to touch them directly. And the operating system that is coming out for Macs maybe later this fall is also got bigger buttons, wider spread apart user interface elements. There's a lot of reasons you might believe that if not this year soon, Apple is going to make the first Macs that have a touchscreen. And I see apps like Fourscore that I annotate on with my Apple Pencil. And I have to, maybe I'm just being idealistic, but I think to myself, man, wouldn't it be cool if I could run their forthcoming Mac app on a Mac where I could not only touch the screen, but fold the screen over back of the keyboard and write on it with an Apple pencil. Yeah. That's my dream computer, which is like the portable version of your dream computer. And so I rambled on a lot there and threw out all sorts of stuff that we can dig into any one of those things. I just said as much as you want, but I, to me, I'm seeing like the, the, while people are talking about touch max, it seems to me like it would be, it would not be reasonable or it would not be what Apple would is leading us towards that they would just throw a touchscreen on the current Macs that we have. It seems like if they're bringing all of these Mac technologies to the iPad, all these iPad technologies to the Mac, it would seem like they would make a Mac that you could draw on with an Apple pencil. And then why wouldn't you be able to flip the screen over the back? I guess is. You mean fold it? I don't know fold. what you mean by flip the screen over the back. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm thinking I'm referring to an episode of a podcast we both listened to that who knows if you're a music educator listening to this, you'll be interested in the accidental tech podcast, but they were talking about like how the iPad now you can buy a, a keyboard attachment that adds like really good cursor support 
to the entire operating system. And one of the things they, they talk about in this episode is if people are going to just use the iPad with the keyboard attached all the time and they want this more desktop s- style system, wouldn't it have been more efficient to actually just instead of having the iPad where the whole brain of the computer is in the iPad, making it really top heavy, wouldn't it have made more sense to actually put most of the brain in the iPad in the keyboard cover itself, which could potentially make the overall footprint of the device lighter. And therefore, maybe you would get it into a tablet mode by flipping, folding the keyboard on the back side of itself rather than detaching the tablet. And that's how that's how notebook computers are built. The the, the brains are inside the keyboard deck because that's the part that needs to be heavier. And if you look at the side of, of a MacBook Pro or a MacBook Air or something like that, that screen is razor thin because it doesn't have anything in it other than the screen. And uh, yeah, th- this is the thing. I think uh, Windows Notebooks sometimes refer to this as a 360 hinge, a 360 degree hinge so that it, it rotates past where we normally expect uh, uh, a normal hinge on a laptop to break but yeah flip it back over itself so that you could have something like that yeah i would love something like that and having something like that in rehearsal would be amazing especially and and i think in my ideal version where there's something approximately the size of the imac that i could write on would be great with an apple pencil i i love my apple pencil my ipad i've been using them all day today and something like that on a music stand in a rehearsal room would be amazing and i hope that what you are observing and the, what a lot of other people have observed about changes to Mac hardware and to the Mac operating system are going to lead to something like that, at least being possible. Now it would be really sad if we made all these changes and that ended up just being that you could be used for score by clinking around your trackpad. But I, I don't think that would be the case. And certainly Fourscore is is in a pretty rapid development cycle. Uh, I think I'm on their, their betas right now. By the way, there's a warning at the top of all of their, their release notes for the betas. This is don't use this in, in a real life performance. This is a beta, you dope. And, but I don't ignore, I, I ignore that usually. Um, I've used the Fourscore beta in some of the most important musical performances of my life. <laughs> I'm, fine. So I got a little gun shy when I first, jumped on the beta train it hosed my library and i had to rebuild my library but that was six years ago so I that's the had stuff that of nightmares i don't know why you said yeah. that to me <laughs> it was when i transitioned from the release to the beta since i've been on the beta i have had no problems um, but it's why i have not gotten back off the beta <laughs> <laughs> that's fair but yeah, I, I, and having Fourscore on the Mac would be great. Having Good Notes on the Mac in a way that I can write with my Apple Pencil. Good Notes exists on the Mac such as it is now, but ha- being able to write with Apple Pencil in Good Notes on the Mac would be amazing. And that's another app that's in a pretty rapid development all the time as well. And so I feel like that would do really good stuff to have that in both places. Are, speaking of betas, are you on the Good Notes beta? No, actually. Should I be? Is it good? So the next, so they just released a collaboration in Good Notes, which I have not really tried very much yet. Um, Actually, now that I think about it, I don't think I've tried it at all. Happy to test um, that with you, by the way. We should do that for sure. I wonder if it would work if you're not on the beta. We can try it and find out, though. Sure. Um, Oh, is that not out yet? I thought that had been released. That is out. Okay. But like, I'm still on the beta, so it's got still new things that that yours wouldn't have, right? Okay, got it. So the thing that is new in the new one that I'm very excited about because I'm a nerd is a new text tool because their text tool sucks. And you'll be able to put a background on your text objects so you, you can see them on when you place text on top of things and you can have rich text inside of your text tool so that you can have one thing italics and the rest of it not, which is the thing that I deal with all the time in music stuff because I try to model like the correct way to italicize and not italicize certain kinds of titles and not other kinds of titles or foreign words and not English words, like all kinds of stuff like that. And you couldn't do it before. Either the whole text object had to be italics or none of it. And so right. now there's a much better set of rich text tools that are coming to GoodNotes in the beta. It's going to be really cool. I That's the thing. Like, if I shared a notebook with you, I don't know what would happen to it. I could just try it and not put any text objects in it. That would probably be the first thing to try. But Sure. Anyway. Do I need to go to my way to get on that beta or is there just a link to it somewhere on the web? I think there's just a link to it if you look around either the Reddit or their Twitter feed or something. It's one of these betas that's like pretty wide open. But they're a good team. I've I've had several like Skype calls with the the GoodNotes developers over the last five years when they're doing their user research. 
Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, you are, if anyone, the, a good notes the the good notes power user. <laughs> I, I am. I'm certainly a good notes power user. I would like to believe that there are at least five to six of us. But if they told me tomorrow that it was going to be ten dollars a month to subscribe to it, I would jump. I, I feel bad. I haven't paid them in two, three years. It's. I don't want to call it a one trick pony for me, but there's definitely one thing I do with it. 99% of the time and that's to annotate my like I was saying earlier my rather than printing a copy of my seating chart every day I just have a paper style which is the current oh, yeah. version of my band seating chart and it, the thing that I like about GoodNotes is GoodNotes is this great I think of it as the kind of like the be, the best handwritten note app that is on iOS but it also is really good at dealing with PDFs if what you want to do with them is just draw right on them with the Apple Pencil. It just takes away all the annotation mode taps and clicks. There I am again, mixing metaphor. Metaphor? What's the word for distinguishing a tap and a click? Not a metaphor. You actually tap and click a device. You know what I mean? No, yeah, the word but, you're looking for is. I know what you mean, though. I guess you click a pencil to the page, though, do you? What's the verb? I think we still for, call that a tap, maybe. I think so. Yeah, maybe it is a tap. It's going to be all screwed up when we can run iOS apps on our Macs, though. So that's the thing. And I know that neither of us have industry knowledge, but I do. you do have a lot of experience with the professional and creative music software, which I feel like has to some degree inform what you think is reasonable from a hardware and a software perspective. Do you think that they would, with all the other technologies that they are integrating across platforms, do you really think that they would make a touchscreen Mac that didn't have pencil kit support? Oh, no way. No way. Now, if they did that, at least with the current Apple Pencil 2, there would have to be some way of syncing the Apple Pencil 2 with the new Mac, which only right now happens by clicking on the little magnetic thing on the side of the iPad. So there would have to be some other weird hardware thing, or there'd have to be an Apple Pencil 3 that then would, again, not work with my iPad Pro. That would Uh, be devastating. (laughs) I've got two Apple Pencil 2s because it is so critical to my workflow that I keep a backup Apple Pencil in my desk in my office at school because I have once broken one and not had one for a day, and it destroyed me. (laughs) (laughs) I completely rely on it, and I would be very sad if I had to go out and spend another $200 on another Apple Pencil or something like that, because I'm sure it would not be the same price as the current one, And but if it allowed me to then spend another several thousand dollars on a new Mac and use it with the Mac and my iPad, then I would be all over it for sure. And I'm totally with you. The ability to just write all over something and the ability to have your own built-in templates and things, I've got templates for my lessons i've got templates for the theory whiteboarding stuff that i do in class so yeah i i I can show you my good notes stuff sometime too did we talk about good notes a lot the last time i was on i feel like oh yeah a ton a ton i feel like that was probably the main topic (laughs) that and pdf expert oh yeah that's what i've been doing all day today i taught a couple of theory lessons or theory lectures and i taught a bunch of lessons and graded a bunch of homework so i've been living in good notes and pdf expert all day And see, the thing is like the idea of not, because you can already easily integrate Mac OS and Apple Pencil through things like Apple has that feature where you can, I think it's called Sidecar, where you can put a window or you can send a window of an app to your iPad screen or even just use your iPad as a second display for the Mac. And this happens to me all the time. The Mac is just the device that I'm on and I get some kind of financial document that I have to sign and I'm like... There's a lot of really convenient ways to get that that document to my iPad, but if all I need to do with it on my iPad is sign it, I know this this is like sounds ridiculous, but it, the products are already so convenient that the micro conveniences drive me nuts. Like I'm thinking to myself, okay, I can save this to iCloud and then open the file on my iPad. Uh, I can send it just this window of Microsoft Word to my iPad using the the sidecar feature, and then I can sign it there. Or what if I could just touch my Apple Pencil straight to the screen that I'm looking at? Apple has to want it to be that way. Yeah, there's there's a thing, I think, is it called Continuity Sketch? Have you? I have not really spent a ton of time with this, but there is a way within marking up a PDF on your Mac with continuity that you can just like temporarily open the thing on your iPad and write on it, and it like does it on your Mac. It's like a, it's not Sidecar, but it's related to Sidecar. 
Okay, link me some documentation on that. I did not know that would be... Well. Right now, I have my signature saved in preview for also signing useful. documents. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have um, mine in PDF expert. It's it's always... I'm always getting Word documents that I have to sign. I I I try to harangue my students very early on that it's rude to send somebody a Word document because you're assuming that they have Word and they have exactly the same fonts and everything that you have. And so you should never send somebody a Word document. That's rude. Yeah. That's great. Uh, tell that to my bank. <laughs> yeah. I also tell people that if I have to open a Microsoft Office application, it's a bad day in David's world. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. At the middle school level, it's very different. It's like any way that you will actually do the work, please do the work. So I'm like... It's Absolutely. Like, like, it's, I'm in the Canvas speed grader and one kid, I can't. I just can't. I've been up for the past hour and I'm like, just email it to me. It's fine. It's really okay. Just email it. So I've got it in email, Canvas speed yeah. grader. <laughs> Yeah. Various Related formats. technology, by the way, to con- continuity camera is continuity camera or continuity markup is continuity camera, which lets you like use your iPhone camera to scan a thing with your Mac. I use that it's all the similar... time. It's amazing. Yeah. I have not tried it from my Mac, but I scan things all the time with my iPhone camera. I'll have to, I have looking at this continuity markup documentation that I just sent you makes me think I should look at continuity camera too. It's really useful for making keynote presentations. If you need to quickly take a picture of something that you want to put in a slot. The continuity clipboard saves me all the time because I, the syncing of a good note to iCloud and back down from my Mac to the, the iPad is not like instant. It's not slow, but it's not instant. And sometimes I'm like putting stuff together right before class starts. So if I have a musical example up on my Mac, I'll just use the command shift four keyboard shortcut to do a screenshot that copies it to the clipboard and then instantly paste it on my ipad onto the 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 whiteboard for class that day i yeah that's an awesome feature it it, is only more recently working consistently for me with images it's a little slow interesting okay yeah when you watch the apple developer conference and stuff you're excited you know what to expect so i'm always testing these features if not in the public beta like the day that they drop in the fall and it's one of these things that when a feature doesn't work the first time, it's super easy to just forget that it exists and give up on it. I'm glad I continued to try that clipboard feature because to just copy something from my Mac and then hit paste on my iPad and boom, there it is. So perfect. I've also, this is unrelated, but I have been only very recently using a clipboard manager on my Mac to like access. What are you, you know, using? Things. Alfred. Yeah, me too. Okay. Yeah. Like uh, a control command. C brings up a history of all the things I've copied to my clipboard recently, and it's everything from images to text. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's really nice. It's so good to just go back. What's the thing I copied three copies ago? It's for great. putting like a list of links together for somebody, it's very handy. Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. Or if you are uh, integrating Flipgrid with Canvas through LTI and you have like two or three different api codes that you have to copy and paste from one tab of a browser to another yeah the the alfred clipboard history is all i need but yeah i've often one of the cool things about clipboard managers is a lot of them like they don't they play perfectly nicely with one another so if you wanted to try a different one it's super trivial to do that i haven't had a ton of reason to do that but the other thing i use the alfred clipboard manager for is that it will if you i don't know if this is a setting but anything other than my most recent item is plain text. So it, it does not save them as rich text, which can be a problem, but usually it's what I want is, is to just be plain text. That's interesting. Yeah. I'll have to tweak that a little bit. That sounds like a good setting to have on. Huh? All right. Speaking of Apple, like very <laughs> wide reaching Apple topics that <laughs> do you, so like recently Apple is in the news for a bunch of reasons involving like their app store policy. A lot of developers, some of which are very big are trying to tackle some of these issues. I think it's interesting that the the company that makes the game Fortnite is like in this whole lawsuit with Apple and has now been oh, removed God. from the store. Yeah. And I just, we talked about a little bit last time, the impact of app store policy on musical professional software and I don't want, I'm like kind of tired of all this stuff being in the tech news, but I, I am wondering like, do you see a shift, like a slow and steady shift? Is Apple going to eventually fold underneath all this pressure? For For those who don't follow this world, all you need to know is that a lot of big developers are frustrated with Apple's 
a lot of different things that they demand of developers. Of course, the 30% pay cut of in-app purchases is a big one of those. In-app purchases is, is one of the only viable ways to make a living off of the App Store right now. It's one of the only... It's one of the only models that you can even have a business on the App Store right now, especially if you're trying to do anything other than just sell a one-time purchase app. So, Yeah, I think we talked about this previously in the context of StaffPad, which is a $90 purchase app on the iPad, a music notation app that you enter handwriting and it converts it into lovely engraved music. And that's a really heavy lift for a lot of people since there's no way to do free trials in a meaningful way in the app store. There's some kind of weird workarounds that all have their own problems associated with them, but there's not like really a normal free trial way and dropping 90 bucks on something like that is a lot for a lot of people. And I, I, I certainly can tell you that I would not have tried it if I was not on the beta for it. That's a big part of it for, for me. And the thing about the Epic lawsuit and some of the other legal actions and other investigations that are ongoing about Apple's app store policies and practices. The thing that I am worried about is that some government who either deliberately or accidentally misunderstands the consequences of some action will do something that makes the operating system less secure or less useful in some major way. And we see things like this all the time. Like we can't do this one thing because there's this weird law that was written for telecom in the 1970s or the 1870s. And therefore we can't do this really useful thing. And I'm worried about something like that happening. I'm worried about, for example, some major government saying that Apple has to allow side loading of apps or that Apple has to allow and by side loading, getting apps from just downloading them on the internet like you can on Windows or Mac, because that's how you get a lot of security problems. I don't mind that Apple looks over all of the software that runs through the Mac app store or the iOS app store to make sure that it's going to run okay and be safe for me to run on my computer and that it has all of the privacy and security concerns that I would want to have on a device that I do so spend so much of my life and do so much of my work on. On the other hand, I really wish Apple would take it upon itself to make some changes that will appease some of the louder complaints. The thing that I think is the easiest for them to do is just to allow people to insert their own payment processing systems into their apps, which they already allow for applications where you buy stuff. When you go into the Amazon app, as I did earlier today, and order some nonsense from the internet, you don't, you give your credit card to Amazon, Apple doesn't even know that a transaction has occurred, and it's totally fine. And I, I think Apple's excuse that there is the possibility for credit card fraud is not super reasonable. I think it's it's very self-serving reasoning, and it is does it, it's not borne out. I can give my credit card to any company on the internet, and the last 87 times your credit card number has been stolen. Has it been stolen because you entered it on a website or is, did it get stolen because somebody swiped it at a restaurant or there was a skimmer on a, a, a gas pump or something, right? It, it wasn't on the internet. The internet's actually a pretty secure way to transact commerce compared to f- the physical world. So I, I think that's the thing that would have me there. And that would make it really easy for people to offer free trials. You offer the free trial, Apple can look over and approve your app to see if it's safe and secure and respects user privacy in all the the best ways and then you can download it for free from the app store and then you can pop up a thing on your own as the app developer that says hey if you want to keep using this you got to pay me 90 bucks here's where you can go enter your credit card information and i would be very happy with that and i think that's the only way we're ever going to get real pro software that's not cubasis dumbed down cubase for ipad os and that's not staff pad as much as i love staff pad it's not Sibelius, it's not Dorico, it's not even Finale. It's it's his own thing. So, I don't know. I'm rambling. No, I think what you're getting at is like the experience would be better for developers and for users. And I think that's every argument that I've seen about the specifically the Epic and Apple dispute has really, that, that has been an interesting argument to me, has boiled down to more or less, if Apple made it easier for developers to do what they wanted with their own payment system, we would have more and better and more diverse software on the app store. And and that would make their products more compelling to users who would then want to buy more Apple products 
App- Apple is certainly like making a lot of money, like selling services these days. Whereas I think maybe at one point they were more focused on making really great products. Obviously, their software and their hardware integration is a big and core part of their philosophy as a company. But I would love to see the products continue to have value because of what they can open up to third-party developers. Already, I'm attached at the hip to my Apple stuff because of all the great software that's on it. I would just love to see this move along faster. And yeah, that's the thing. Like The reason that I love my iPad is not that it is a beautiful slab of glass, though it is a beautiful slab of glass. The reason that I love my iPad is that it runs the apps that I use to do all of these different things in my job and all of these different things that I do for fun. And I, I think Apple's arguments really discount the value that the third-party developers are bringing to the platform. If all of the apps that I use on the iPad today suddenly went away and suddenly appeared on Android, I would buy a Samsung Galaxy Tab 3 Pro whatever tomorrow. And it, it's, it, it's not about the fact that it's an iPad or that it's made by a, a, a hip trendy company in Cupertino that has design sense. It's that it runs the apps that I want to run. Sure. Yeah. Without a doubt. I hope that front moves in the, in the same direction that we're talking about, because I sure would love to see uh, a scenario where someone like a Sibelius or Adorico could have a sustainable business model with an app on the app store there's certainly no reason that the hardware of for example the ipad is holding back a company from making a professional application like that and the thing again that i am i'm worried about is that if apple doesn't make a decision on their own and they wait for somebody else to require them to do something that it's going to be a worse solution for them it's going to be a worse solution for developers it'll be a worse solution for users i think if apple decides to make a change or several changes now it will end up being a better solution for everyone. Because when as soon as legislation or court decisions get involved in something like this around technology, the technology suddenly gets locked into whatever the state of that technology is at the moment that decision is made or that law is debated. Right? Not even when that law is passed, but when it is debated. I think Apple making some decisions that are to the benefit of developers and therefore to the benefit of their users now is going to be better for everyone in the long run. And it will require them to have a little bit more humility than they traditionally have had constitutionally since their founding. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I I have nothing else to say about that, by the way. That's a perfect summary. Thank you. Me neither. All right. David, where can listeners find more information about your work and your career? You can find more information about my music and other things like that on my personal website, davidmcdonaldmusic.com. I also have a blog at leftuseless.net where I've been writing more than usual over the last few weeks. It's very sporadically updated. It's very bursty content. But over the last couple of weeks, I've written a, a few different articles about tech things that I'm using. And then you can find me on Twitter, Dave Macdo, D-A-V-E-M-A-C-D-O. And links to all that stuff is on my website and on the blog as well. Awesome. So good to chat. We'll, we'll talk soon. Likewise. I'm Robbie Burns. Thanks for listening to Music Ed Tech Talk. You can find the show's page, show notes for the episode, and my blog at musicedtechtalk.com. You can subscribe to blog posts, through an RSS app of your choice, and you can subscribe to the podcast and the podcast app of your choice. You can now get blog posts delivered right into your email inbox once a week. Please rate and review in the podcast app. It absolutely helps. It'll take a second and a few taps. Word of mouth is helpful too, so please spread the word. Learn more about my music and teaching career at RobbieBurns.com. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at Robbie Burns. Thanks to this episode's sponsor, Music First. Be sure to check them out. See you next time.